Okay, welcome everyone to this first marketing and practice session. Um, we institu want to institutionalize these extracurricular lectures for you, so to give you a bit of a international and uh, interesting and practical lens. Um, and I hope uh, you'll enjoy this first session. I'm pretty sure, actually, because I know Darren, uh, who's sitting over here, uh, and uh, that's always entertaining. Mm -hmm. uh, when he talks, and uh, he's a really a world-renowned scholar in marketing, not only in research, but he's also been awarded as a teacher. So um, I'm pretty sure you're gonna enjoy it. <laughs> and he's gonna talking about no creativity. Yeah, expectation <laughs> management. No so pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. Uh, he's gonna talk about creativity and innovation. And um, yeah, I think uh, you can give a clap for him and um, oh enjoy wow. the lecture. Wait till after. Whoa. Yeah. To start off, I want to talk a bit about chocolate. Chocolate is usually a good topic for most people. Most people love chocolate. Most people find chocolate kind of exciting. So when I uh, first started my academic career, I, I read a lot of different books. And one that really struck out to me was on chocolate. And it was called The Emperors of Chocolate. And I doubt that any of you have read this book. right? But what it talks about is two uh, CEOs, founders, leaders of these big chocolate companies. Now I'm going to ask you, right, what would your guess be on these two chocolate companies? One quick hint though is they're based in America, right? So a little bit of a bias because I know we're not in America, but if I put you on the spot and said to this guy right here, right, nice headgear, I like it, big chocolate company, who do you think of? Twix. No, no falling out on Twix. No. The company that would make Twix, though, who would that be? These are what I'm looking for. Mars. Excellent, right? So Mars actually is one of these big companies. Mars. Second big company in America to do chocolate. Who would that be? Man right here. Nice white sweater, looking good. I like that. What was the question again? <laughs> I was thinking about my date tonight. I'm not sure. <laughs> Big companies that make chocolate. We got one, Mars. Nestle, good guess, but that's Swiss. I want America. Cadbury, very good guess, UK. So there's one other big one. You guys have nailed three out of the big four. Hershey's, very nice. Hershey's is the second big one. So in the US, right, America, there's two big chocolate companies, Mars, Hershey. Right? And what's interesting about these two companies and why this book, The Emperors of Chocolate, is so cool is it talks about how these companies became big companies, right? Because at the turn of the century, the 20th century, 1910, 1912, 1915, about that time, these companies started, right? And they started in Chicago. Most of the candy companies in America started in Chicago, big American city, right? As little small mom and pop operations. And like a lot of industries, they consolidated into big, big players. And these were two of them. Right? And they were led by two very interesting people. Hershey was led by a guy named Milton, and Mars was led by a guy named Forrest. Right? And why these guys are interesting, why they're the emperors of chocolate, is they ran their companies in very different ways. So one of them, right, this guy here, Milton, he was like Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. Right? He's a really nice guy. He built this town in Pennsylvania called Hershey, excellent, good guess, right? Built a town, named it after himself, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And it actually was a lovely place, right? Had a big, huge chocolate factory that you can still go to today, take the tour, try the chocolate, really fun. But also built an orphanage, parks, libraries. It was really a little utopia in America. And he kind of ran his company like that as well. It was a very, you know, think about your studies in business, a very nice place to work, very cool, very friendly. Everyone treated each other nicely, etc. The eventual successor of his that ran the company actually grew up in the orphanage that he had built. So it was a, a nice story, right? In contrast, not really in contrast, but a very different type of company was the Mars Company. This is still today a privately held company, right? And Forrest worked for his father. His father founded the company, but he fell out with his father and actually went to go work at Hershey, 
learned all the secrets at Hershey, then went back to Mars, hostile takeover, true story, <laughs> and took over the company. And Forrest ran the company very much with an iron fist, right? He had a little, little red book of rules and regulations on how he ran the company. He was very secretive, very private. In fact, very few pictures exist in the public of Forrest Mars. He passed the company on to his two sons, twins, who run the company today. Very successful company, but ran very different than Hershey. Now, why this is interesting okay, is their battle, these two emperors, back and forth over 40, 50 years, through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, 80s. Even today, they still fight. Right? The number one player at the beginning was Hershey. And Hershey built its empire on one specific product. What was that product? No, good guess, but wrong. You should never say to students they're wrong because it hurts their self-esteem. Just kidding, you're okay. <laughs> good guess, though. What other things besides Hershey's Kisses exist? Any guesses? Hershey Bar, excellent. This is a very quick class. I like that. Hershey Bar. And what is a Hershey Bar made out of? My guest faculty member on the front row or a very senior student, hard to say. <laughs> Chocolate, exactly. A Hershey Bar right, is made of straight-on chocolate. That's all it is. It's a chunk of chocolate, right? Now, it was famous because it sold for the same price for decades. What would that price be? Any guesses? Think way back when, back before bread, back before your parents were born. What would the price in American dollars be for this chocolate bar? Guesses here. One dollar. No, way too high. Because remember, 100 years ago, right, things were really cheap. Ten cents, this is a good guess, actually. Even less than ten cents, it was five cents. Five cents. Everyone's like, really? Five cents? Yeah. It was the Hershey five-cent bar. And the price stayed consistent for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Whoa. If your price stays consistent, right, what has to move? Quantity, exactly, right? And so the quantity, the size of the bar, actually moved up and down according to the price of cocoa futures. And so the size of the bar would vary from very big, right, to very small. This is dramatic for effect, right? Obviously, wouldn't be that small. But over the years, you can imagine, right, that the bar actually got smaller and smaller. True story. Now, Mars launched a number of products over time. And as they moved into the 50s, launched a couple of chocolate bars, right? priced them at 10 cents. These bars became famous. What are they known as? What do you got? Famous Mars chocolate bar is called? Snickers is one. Mars, even better, Mars bar, right? This is a very smart class. So a Mars bar or a Snickers bar is made out of what? What's in this bar? Caramel, what else? Chocolate. Biscuit, nougat, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So there's lots of stuff, right, here in the middle. Nougat, air, actually a lot of air in these bars. Caramel, sugar, all kinds of goods. Like peanuts in the Snickers, my Snickers friend, right? And what's on the outside, somebody said? Chocolate, a thin layer of chocolate, which is actually at the time the most expensive ingredient, right? Ten cents, five cents. Hershey was selling their five-cent bar right here. Mars came in with a big bar full of stuff. What happened in terms of market share? Because remember, Hershey was number one. Mars comes in in the 50s, introduces this bad boy. What do you think happens? What's your guess? Completely different products, but you're a consumer. You're at the grocery store. You're looking for a chocolate bar. You know what I mean? <laughs> But it's the big one full of stuff. What do you think the average consumer did? Because this is not the average <laughs> consumer, which is fine. She hates Mars for some reason. Mars did something to her in a previous life. That's okay. I thought you were thinking that it's chocolate. It's just not. <laughs> it's cho it, neither of these are really chocolate. We all know that's true, right? <laughs> but what do you think the average consumer in America did? Yeah. Well, it's more, right? And when you think of America, <laughs> more, right? It's all about more, which is true. That's what happened. So this starts selling like crazy, and they take over number one position. So who's more dominant? Mars takes over, right? Selling 10-cent bar, bigger stuff. If you guys are the managers of Hershey. 
You've got this famous five cent bar. Now you're getting beaten by Mars. What do you do? You're the manager. What are you going to do? Let's see how good this two years of business education has been, my friend. What do you, what do, you do? Nice, right? That's what we, we will develop new products. <laughs> we will kill the competition. Okay, good. I like that, right? And truthfully, that is what Hershey did. Hershey started to develop new products, so your intuition's right. But they also started, right, taking over companies. Often that's what we do. If, if you can't Microsoft, you can't innovate, you just buy new companies, right? So that's what they started to do. But you've still got this Hershey five cent bar, very famous. It's your flagship product, right? You've been selling it for years. What do you do with this? More marketing. <laughs> Yes, okay, you can definitely do more marketing, right? But what should you do with the price and the size? Because it's still this little tiny bar compared to the big one. Improve the size, make it bigger, right? So again, your intuition's correct. They decided to make the bar bigger. So they, they made the bar, they got rid of the small one, right? We could use an eraser, that might work, right? And they changed the price to 10 cents, point of parity. We learn about point of parity in business school. What do you think happened, right? Now I've got this big bar. It's all chocolate for my chocolate friend, right? Or kind of chocolate, right? And you're going head to head. So what happened? The market share went up? What do you think? You think so? You're wrong. You're a little wrong. You don't have to be sorry. I'm just playing with you. Yeah, it actually went worse. Why? Why do you think market share dived after you made a bigger bar and you did it? It's kind of crazy, right? Okay, that's a good guess, but they did see it was such a change. They did see that it was bigger. I mean, that's a great guess. That they, they may have, to your point, they may have seen a price quantity uh, inconsistency. So that could be true. But they was bigger. That wasn't the big driver, but could be. Very clever. Good. Any other guesses? Here. Yeah. Very nice. In, in a very very formal business definition, exactly what happened, right? You were known as the five-cent bar. And you had been the five-cent bar for, for years, right? And people had grown up with the five-cent bar. It had gone with American GIs to Europe in World War II, the five-cent bar. And, and it's like apple pie and Coke and I don't know what it is in Holland. Cheese. I'm not sure, <laughs> right? But it was something that... <laughs> not cheese. He's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I like cheese. It got him to pay attention. Very good. <laughs> okay. But there's no question, right? That's what happened. People said the nostalgia, why this is important to us is this five cent image. And so they said, forget it. If you're going to change what is so important to our history, right, we don't want any part of it. So what happened is it the market share actually fell even further. Oh, years go by. 50s, 60s, 70s, right? And it wasn't until the 70s that the game changed a bit again. How did it change? Well, they're making a movie in the late 70s, right? A guy named Steven Spielberg. Some of you may have heard this name, right? A very famous film producer, director. And he said, you know what? We we're, we're need to put a product in our movie. And so they went to the leader, right, Mars. And he said, okay. Mars, we're making this movie, and we want to pay you to put your product in in our movie. Now, that doesn't happen anymore, right? It's reverse. But this was at ba way back when, right? And they said, hey, we're going to put this product in our movie. We'd love to put your M&Ms in our movie. It's about a little alien. The alien walks like this. Its finger lights up. Would you be in the movie? Well, what did Mars say? I don't know what they said. They said no. They said, are you kidding? We'll put an alien movie? That would be crazy, right? So they said, okay, fine. We'll go to Hershey. And they asked the second player, Hershey, would you be in our movie? Right? This movie, obviously, is E.T. Well, Hershey had just taken over a company called what? They make the nerds candy? No, good guess, but not quite. That's right. They took over Reese's, right? And Reese's was just launching this product called Reese's Pieces, the little ones with peanut butter inside. And so what happened was they said, sure, we'll do it. It's a product launch for Reese's Pieces. They put it in the movie. Biggest success of a new product launch for the organization in its history because of that product placement. The game changed again in, in North America. Hershey went, right, from being number two back to being number one 
and Mars felt it too. Now, since then, obviously, this battle has gone back and forth, right? The battle has continued between these two companies. Mars is much more successful internationally than Hershey's, but they continue to go battling back and forth. Now, this story, right, sets up the lecture. How does it set up the lecture? These two companies going back and forth. What happened, right, when you think of the movie product placement, what happened when you think about changes in the product formulation? What was going on year after year in this industry and, frankly, in all industries? What was changing? Preferences of consumers change. And what do these companies have to do to keep up if the preferences are changing? They have to innovate. They have to change. And what's interesting about most companies, right, and there's differences across sectors, is innovation is becoming more and more important. Some have argued, right, that you innovate or you die in this. When you think of technology, laptops, think of automobiles, airplanes, you name it, right, innovation is becoming more and more important in society. There's lots of examples of companies, right, that have just ceased to exist. One of my favorite is a company called Smith & Corona. Most of you won't know this company because it made typewriters. And in 1989, they had the best year ever. We're talking profits of hundreds of millions of dollars in 1989. And they took some of that profit and they bought a company called Acer. You've heard of Acer. Have not heard of Smith & Corona. Because two years after buying it, they said, you know what, this is a bad investment. We're not sure people will use these laptop things. So they sold the money and built a factory in Mexico to make more typewriters. <laughs> True story. <laughs> the company went bankrupt and ceased to exist in 1995. Very sad story, especially if you held stock in Smith and Corona. Right? Innovation, learning how to be innovative, building creativity into your company is important. The IBM company, which you'll all know that name, right, did a poll. They uh, asked 1,500 CEOs from around the world Ask them, what's the most important skill that you can develop as a business leader? So you're a CEO, Mr. CEO. What do you think is most important to put in your toolbox, right, so that you can become the next CEO? And what they thought peop people would say, right, this was done in 2010, was ethics, authenticity, integrity, right, because we had just come out of this global 2008 crisis, very bad, very, very bad, banking, bad, right? And they were surprised when the CEOs came back and said creativity. They said, if you're going to be a leader, right, which theoretically all of you are going to be, hopefully, what do you need to be? You need to be more creative. <laughs> Is that true? Yes or no? We pick on more people. You get my style here. Sorry about that. If you don't know the answer, just pass to the person to the right or to the left and just say, I'm going to throw you under the bus. You answer, right? So if I asked you, Right? Do you buy that? Do you think creativity and innovation are important for you? Why? Defend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're not able to come up with something new, but is that the leader's job? Can't you like have someone that took innovation and in their undergrad do that? Like why do you have to be creative as the leader? Can't you just farm it out to those nerdy guys that do that stuff? You have to be able to see when there's something new. I like that. Do you agree with him? Yeah. Oh, I was going for you, but she's going to take it. That's all right. You take it. You saved her. That, that's true at the company level, but why do you have to be innovative? You specifically. I, I, I agree. That's kind of what he said, and then he built on it and said you have to recognize it. That seems reasonable, but why do you have to become creative? Stand out. Even as a person? If you look at this room, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of characters in here. You've got to stand out from these guys? <laughs> but maybe at some point. 
what what can you add? Come back to you. Once your employees to outsmart you. Okay, so being a true leader means that you have to cultivate, facilitate, and be at the head of the creativity charge. That's what you're saying. Okay, cool. Everybody take out a piece of paper. Hopefully you have a piece of paper. Does everybody have a piece of paper? Bring out a piece of paper and a pen. Got to have a big test right now. You guys have no paper? You have no pen? You have nothing? <laughs> oh, I need, I need to. Oh, look at that. Help. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is uh, getting quality education. All right, everybody's got a pen and a paper. Everybody has to play. Yeah, write down one word. No. Everybody ready? All right, so what I want you to do, pen, paper, in hand. Turn to take a look at the left. Take a look at the right. Pick one or the other, and you have one minute to draw the person next to you. Go. I've drawn him before. Go for it. It doesn't matter. You've got 60 seconds. Let's see what you can do. Person next to you. See what you can do. Thirty seconds left. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds left. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, ten. Okay, time's up. Show your picture to the person that you drew. <laughs> okay, simmer, simmer, settle, simmer. So a pretty, a pretty simple exercise. Yet, when I asked you to do it, what was the reaction of the class? <laughs> <laughs> so a <laughs> what, is, what does what <laughs> mean? What's the reaction? Back row, my friends in the back row, green shirt. What's the reaction? Loud and proud. Why are we doing this? Okay, fair enough. Why are we doing this? Was there any other reaction besides <laughs> And why are we doing this? Can't draw, a little bit of laughter, right? And then people did it. Most of you did it, right? Then I asked you to show the picture. What did people do when I asked to show the picture? Apologies. <laughs> there was actually a fair number of apologies. And laughter. Embarrassment. And embarrassment. <laughs> embarrassment, apologies, and laughter. That's kind of sad. Why is it so hard? Why is it embarrassing? Why did people apologize to draw a little picture? Why did you feel uncomfortable doing that? He's like, I'm actually fine. I will draw everyone in this room twice. Fair enough. <laughs> For those of you that want to admit it, why was it hard or uncomfortable to do this? 
because I can't draw, right? People might judge me. I don't feel good at this. It's hard, right? Some people have argued, right, that we're losing the ability to be creative. If you look at Ken Robinson, some of you might know this fellow. He's uh, out of the UK. does a really wonderful TED Talk, by the way. So if, you, if you're bored one day surfing, Ken Robinson, great talk about creativity and education, right? Daniel Pink wrote a book about how we're losing creativity. Business Week, American Publications said, what happened to creativity, right? We're losing it as a society. One of the reasons is argued is this type of exercise. It's because it's embarrassing, it's hard to do, I don't want to stick out, people might judge me, right? Very famous story about the CEO of Hallmark Cards, which is a little card company, right? And he used to like to go into elementary schools and see the kids in kindergarten, five years old, and go in and talk about what it's like to, 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 to be an artist and run a company. And he would go into the classroom and he'd look around the walls and there's all these art and pictures that the kids had drawn. And he'd go up to the front of the class and he'd start his talk by saying, how many of you want to be artists when you grow up? Right? And all the kids would be like, yeah, me, I want to be an artist. Yeah, pick me, pick me, right? And he says he did that again in grade three, three years later. Eight-year-old, nine-year-old kids go into the class and ask how many of them want to be artists. And about 30, 40% of the kids put up their hand. And he talks about going in later, right? Junior high school, high school, talking about it. Very few, if any, kids put up their hand. Now, whether you agree with, you know, this type of story, this type of activity or not, it's an interesting question. Are we as a society creative? Are you as an individual creative? Right? And there's a lot of debate on this. Some people are like, <laughs> right, like that. Other people are like, yeah, it's a problem. So I push you, as a first question, to think about this. In society, and you specifically, are you creative? Do you feel creative? What does it mean to be creative, right? Because I framed it in art. And art is one type of creativity. But obviously, engineers can be very creative. Business students can be, maybe, creative, right? What does it mean to be creative? Some have argued that some of the standardized tests that we use so you think about a GRE or a GMAT or an LSAT. All these tests that are forced upon us actually eliminate creativity because they test for very specific things. If you think of the history of the IQ test, does anyone know the history of the IQ test? Does anyone know what the IQ test is? Yeah, okay, okay, we heard that one. IQ test, developed by Alfred Binet, 1905. It was developed as a test to assess people for mental disorders. That was the original purpose, right? And that's what it was used for. And it actually has a very interesting history. It was used for things like eugenics. It was used to screen people for different things. And it's only in the last 20, 30, 40 years that it's been known as a test of intelligence, per se. But it tests a very specific type of intelligence, right? Causal reasoning, logic, this type of intelligence. It doesn't really test creativity or emotional intelligence or things like that. But some have argued that our education is pushing more towards that type of intelligence versus creativity. Interesting argument. We're not <coughs> going to get into a ton of that here. But I think it's interesting, and you should just be aware of it and say, well, okay, that's cool. I'm really good at these subjects and these subjects. My ask to you is, are you good at creativity? If it's important, and four or five of you said, yeah, that's important, you've got to have that. How much of your training at school is on creativity? Do we have a course here in the university on creativity? <laughs> this silly lecture. Nice, that's all you got. <laughs> yeah, so we do have some innovation, which is great, right? I'd push you to think about it, right? But can creativity be taught? What do you think? Back row with the cool earrings. like that. So that, that opinion, which is a good opinion, strong opinion, says you can create environments where people can be creative, and I totally believe that's true, but people are either creative or not creative. I'm kind of putting words in your mouth. That's not what you meant. So you believe people can't, okay, so then I'm a little confused. Give it to me again. All people are creative. 
Right. Okay. Okay. So everyone is creative. Are we all the same? So we're not all the same on creativity. <laughs> I like <laughs> It's like, I am not going to get pinned down on anything. <laughs> I like that. All right? We all have differences. Totally true. We all have different skills. Some people are just more adept at, 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 at even at like numbers versus writing. Totally true. Right? And you could say that some people are probably, and this is what I believe, some people are more creative than other people because of maybe the environment, how they were raised, or the school they went to, these types of things. It's probably true. But I totally agree that all people are creative. That voice says, though, we can't, we can't, teach people to be creative, which I think is a reasonable hypothesis. You wanted to say. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So, so a bit of a pushback, though sh she may say that that's the environment that creates that, but uh, two different views, right? One that, yes, you can train a bit, the other that, no, you can't. And, and this is, there's a debate on this. So I, I think both sides, we could put them in a, a, a ring and see what happens, right? It's certainly a debate. Any other feelings? And you're right. Computer games, there's research that shows that computer games can facilitate creativity. So that's, that's a nice citation right there. Thoughts right there. Oh, I like that. Okay. So, so that, that response is that, that, some of it's innate. It's what you either were born with or raised with. Some of that's just there. But then at the margin, you can move it. Yeah, I think that, that that's a nice hypothesis. What do you think? I really don't know. It's like, that's why I'm in this class. <laughs> Maybe. Right, so so a little bit of a mixture in terms of what what the other people have said, and I think I think we could settle there, at some level. Definitely, contextual environment is important. Definitely, there's some innate to it, and and definitely, you know, people do feel you can move it a bit. <coughs> now the debate's still ongoing, but that's kind of where I sit. Kind of like a continuum, and if you're here on a continuum, you can probably move somewhat by looking at you know people that are creative and trying to build like a muscle, right? Because everyone has that. Build that muscle so that you're better at it. What's interesting to me is in the Harvard Business Review, they published five, six, seven, eight years ago an article called The Innovator's DNA. And so what they did is they looked at a sample of, of some of the leading innovators, the most creative people that run companies. And they spent time with these people, at, with the sample, right, to try to figure out what makes them different. Why is you know, a Richard Branson who was in the sample, right, or a Michael Dell who was in the sample. Why are they more creative or perceived to be more creative? What about them is different? And so they looked at the different characteristics and they wrote this article and they identify five different things, right? And so what I wanted to do was give you a couple of them today, just personally, so that you could take that with you, right, and say, okay, if I want to get more creative, these are things I got to work on. Because that's the push from this type of an article, this type of a viewpoint. And there's lots of books and things that have been written on this. So, for example, The Ten Faces of Innovation, right, which is a book uh, that came out of IDEO. And IDEO, does anyone know what IDEO is? This is one of the world's most famous design companies. And they're renowned, right, for the environment they create for creativity, but also for the work that they do. And so there's a number of books, articles, etc., written that can help you improve this notion of creativity. And they're not like, at least to me, they're not like crazy self-help books or anything. They just point out things that, that make you different. And a lot of these aren't surprising, right? So one of the first ones, when you talk about, well, how do you get more innovative? <laughs> right? The first one that I would mention and talk about, which all of you do, right, is observation. And it's a proven... Lots, and we won't go into psychology articles, but it's proven, right, that if you see things and have the ability to see things, if your observation skills are astute, you'll be a more creative individual. Now, for me, that really came to life when I started my PhD, right? 
and you know, there's people here that are faculty that have done a PhD. And, and one of the big things about, not that any of you are going to, though I hope you do, go on and do a PhD, right, is you want to try to find an advisor, a professor, right, that's really smart, that's doing great research. And what you do is you tie your wagon to that professor, right, and you learn from them and you, like, sit at their feet and there's wise and whatever, right? So when I started my PhD, I, the guy that I was going to be the student under, he retired the day I showed up, right? So that was kind of bad news for me. <laughs> so I'm like, crap, this sucks, right? And so I thought, oh, I better find a new professor. And they had these two very famous professors at the university I, I did my PhD at. And I thought, if I work really hard over the summer, right, these guys are going to let me be their student. So I thought, I, c I can totally do this. So I worked my butt off, right? You guys know how that is, right? You're doing the all-nighter. You're just working. And so that's what I was doing, hoping that these guys would notice me, like, hey, me, right? And they'd invite me to do research with them, and then I could sit at their feet and learn. And I was thrilled in September when I got a call, right? They said, hey, come up to the office. We've got a research project we want you to work on. I'm like, yeah, I'm super excited. And one of these professors was very famous for doing research on classical conditioning, right? Think of Pavlov's dog and the bell and doing it in a consumer context, right? How do you bring classical conditioning to consumer behavior, right? Which was pretty cool. And so he had done some work in the 80s on this. And I thought, that's cool. I'm going to get to do stuff. I'll get to ring a bell. It'll be great, right? I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And so I went into the office, and I, I sat down, and they're like, Darren, we've just got this research grant from the government. We want to start this whole new research project. We want to know if you're interested. I'm like, I'm totally interested. Like, okay. But the research is a bit different. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. What is it? I'm like, we'd like you to do research on sex. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, I am willing to have all the sex that is required to complete this research project. And they're like, no, no, Darren, you're a little confused. It's not like sex. What we want you to do research on is condoms. Okay, that's a bit creepy, but that's fine. I will try all of the condoms and report back to you on which is the best condom. And they're like, no, no, Darren, you're confused. What we'd like you to do research on is how people buy condoms. I'm like, oh, even more creepy. <laughs> but all right, I'll go down to the, the drugstore, the pharmacy, and I'll watch someone buy a condom, and I'll come back and report to you about what happened that they bought a condom. And they're like, no, no, Darren, you're confused. What we'd like you to do is I'd like you to stand in the aisle of the store every Friday and Saturday night from 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock for the next four months. <laughs> and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's what we want you to do. I'm like, okay. So that's what I did. I stood in the aisle, and I watched people and what they would do when they came into the aisle to buy condoms. And what's interesting is people are really weird, right? I would record how much time they took, who they were with, if they'd take one off the eye, would they turn it around and look at it, would they put it in the basket, would they hide it in things under the basket, would they go to the pharmacist and buy it, or would they go to the regular counter, would they go to the woman, would they go to the man, did they go with friends, did they shoplift it? I would record everything, right? And after these four months of watching this, we were able to come up with right, a lot of interesting insights because we had spent so much time watching and observing what people would actually do. The research was funded by Health Canada because right at that point in time, AIDS and STDs had really spiked and they wanted to put money towards understanding what are the barriers for people getting condoms. And we were able to identify barriers, everything ranging from emotions like embarrassment to price because these types of products are very socially sensitive to people. Things like adult diapers, tampons, lice shampoo. It's a whole category. Often they're in the same aisle they call it the Isle of Shame, right? <laughs> but there's things you can do as a marketer to make it easier for people to buy. Now, this experience made me think that observation is very cool and interesting. And my whole career now has been based on watching people, right, seeing what they do, and trying to be creative about building a research question. Now, lots of companies do this as well. One of the best examples is Dyson. And most of you know Dyson because they make a cool vacuum, right? A cooled, I don't know if they have them at home, the Airblade dryers. I just sit in the bathroom at the restaurant and I just do that all day because it's so cool, right? They have a cool wheelbarrow. I don't know if you've seen their wheelbarrow. You got to get one. It's cool. The fan, right, that you put, like, I love that stuff, right? How do they come up with a lot of these? Well, number one, they're a technology company. But number two, they use this notion, what's often called a bug list, right? Things that piss you off, annoy you, they'll solve that problem. They observe what people 
have issues with. So when you go into the bathroom, right, you're at a club or at a a restaurant, and you wash your hands, and you remember those old blow dryers, and you try to dry underneath them, and they don't dry, and you walk out, and your hands are still wet, and then you shake someone's hand, and it's like, oh, you peed on your hand, and like, no, I didn't, but maybe I did, I don't know, right? (laughs) It's because they don't dry them, and that bugs you, that pisses you off. Observing, watching people, watching yourself, first key to creativity. Now, how do you develop that skill? Right? Some of, and this goes back to what people said earlier. Some people already have that. Some people like to people watch. Maybe you're that person. You go to a club or you go to a cafe, and you just sit and you watch people, and it's fun. Other people are completely, it might be creepy, that's true. <laughs> Careful how far you take these advice points, especially you, all right? No, I'm totally true. But some of you, right, completely, and you may have friends like this, completely oblivious to the world around them. Not paying attention, not observing. To become creative, you need to develop that skill. There's a very famous uh, paper in psychology written about people that travel, actually, that go around the world, that visit other places and see other cultures are more creative. El Bulli, the very famous restaurant in Spain, some of you may know this restaurant, it was open for a number of years, recently just closed, famous for its creativity. In their business model, the restaurant was only open six months of the year. Kind of cool. The other six months, the chefs were traveling abroad, observing and watching how people eat. They'd come back to the restaurant, build the menu for the next year. Very cool case study on creativity. So that's the first one. Improve your observation skills. Two, right, classic Apple, right, think different. People that are creative think a bit differently. And what do I mean by that? Pull that paper out for a second, right? Flip it over. 30 seconds. I want you to draw an alien. Any alien you want, draw an alien. 30 seconds, go. Alien. 30 seconds to draw an alien. My friend in the back row is, why are we doing this Fifteen seconds for your alien. Nice. Good. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, you're done. Pencils down. So you drew an alien. What's interesting about this alien... Right? And we could do a show and tell and make you all show each other your aliens, but we won't do that. Right? What's interesting about this alien is this is a test of creativity. Over the last hundred years, they've developed tests of creativity. A very famous one from the 50s is the Dunker candle problem, where you're given materials, a candle, a box, some tacks, right? and you have to figure solve the problem of putting the thing together. Right? That's one way. And if you could do it, you were creative. If you can't, you suck. Right? So that was one test. And in the 60s, Torrance developed the brick test. I don't know if any of you know this. You get a brick, and what are the things you can do with the brick? Right? And you would list all the things you could do with a brick. True story. And if you could come up with lots of things, you were... Cre- so there's lots of these tests. Most of them I'm not really sure about. This is one from the 80s. And this test right, looks at what you draw as an alien. And most people right, have a hard time moving away from what they know. And what I mean by that is most of your aliens probably have eyes and legs, and arms, and so that means you're not very creative, (laughs) right? Which is interesting, because we as people, right, naturally when you say think, you think, is this a good pen or a bad pen? I don't want to wreck your board. I'll draw it in the air. P-O-L-R, right? Psychologists would say that most of us follow what's called the P-O-L-R. What is that? The path of least resistance. As humans, you're trained to be efficient. Think about it, right? Life is freaking hard. You've got to save all of your energy for important things, whatever those are, right? And so we live as humans on what's called heuristics, which are simple little rules, little plans, 
And think about it, even when you get up in the morning. If you're like me, I'm on autopilot for the first hour, right? Basically, I'm up, I'm like head, bathroom, shampoo, hair, right? Sometimes I have to do it twice because I can't remember if I did it the first time, if you're like me, right? Because you're just on autopilot. I drive a car, I leave the garage, right? And I'm like, did I shut the door? I don't remember, have to go back, right? That might be OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, but I don't think it is. I think it's just I'm on autopilot, right? And that's the way we are. You're always looking for the easiest way to get something done. So when I say draw an alien, you're like, yeah, okay, cool. I'll draw the guy next to me wi with bigger head, which is what he did, right? That's basically him <laughs> with the bigger head. That's really what that is. And so that's, that's normal. That's the path of least resistance. You take the easiest way to solve the problem and you do it. So how do you get more creative is you push yourself to get off that path, right? You go to the hard places. And, and once I invited the CEO from this famous pharmaceutical type company to come in and talk, and they talked about going to the hard places, that good employees don't take the easy path. They're going to challenge. You don't, if you already have a yes man, you don't need more yes men, right? You don't need crazy people either, back to our stalker analogy, right? But you need people that are going to challenge, that are going to take a bit of a different way around things sometimes. And the path of least resistance is one of the ways that you can think about this, right? Now, in the article, The Innovator's DNA, they frame this as being able to associate things better. And what I mean by that is creativity, right, is a mashup of things that you know. And, by m and we know what a mashup is, right? If you get online, you can pull down some pretty cool mashups of top 40 song, whatever, right? Mashups of commercials. Mashups are things that come together. There's a cool website called Everything's a Mashup because some argue that there's nothing truly new in the world. It's just a mashup of things, bits and pieces of what you already know. The hard part, right, in Think Different is to get off this path of least resistant and go farther, right, in terms of your mashup. So when you think about solving a case problem, you're doing a business strategy case, instead of just doing the obvious, right, go somewhere else. Think about something different and mash it up. Frog Design, and I told you about IDEO, Frog Design is another very cool company based in New York, famous for their work with Apple, famous for their work with Motorola. They use a very simple technique to force their employees to associate differently to get off this path. What do they do? Right? So they get an assignment. One of their assignments was to build Motorola clamshell phone. Remember the old clamshell? Some of you may or may not remember those. They're dead now. But the phones that used to like a clam, right? So the way they do it, right, is they say, okay, our target today, right, is to build a phone. So here's our target phone. So here's our instigator words. Instigator words, right? And then they go random. And the random words are like beach ball, snowboard, Britney Spears. Oh, that's painful, right? Britney Spears, clam. And they list a bunch of very different, completely at random. And then they say, mash them up. Look for underlying associations between these two very disparate entities. And try to figure out, how can I marry these into something cool, right? And that's where the power comes. Because normally when you think about a phone, you're not thinking about this kind of stuff. That forces you off the path of least resistance. A technique the company uses, right, to get these far associations, get people to think differently, Makes them more creative. But wouldn't you still take the path of least resistance when you try to mash them together? You, so you, you totally do, right? But it's, and they, they do it in a group environment. So if someone lames out, people get called on it, right? If you know that the push is, look, I know that I'm supposed to be creative. I know that I've got these very different things. Let's drill down and dig deeper. Let me give you an example, right? I did this with my, one of my MBA classes, and I gave them alarm clock as the target, right? And then some of the words were like ping pong ball, funeral home, right? Uh, peanut butter, et cetera, et cetera. What's interesting is they started to think of weird associations. Funeral home and alarm clock kind of merged. 
and they came up with an idea of a, a, a an alarm clock, and I, they now actually make this product. My MBAs could have been rich, right? An alarm clock that has an actuarial system in it. You know what I mean by actuarial system? So it's basically a really good for goth culture, right? A death alarm clock. When it wakes you up in the morning, you've programmed it so it knows all about you, and it tells you how many more days you have left to live. Creative. <laughs> good morning. You have 4,322 days left. Right? Cool product. I'm not sure who would buy it other than very dark people. Right? But that came out of this mashup of two very different things. I'm not saying it's easy. Like, Don't get me wrong. Because I think our natural tendency is always to go here. You're totally right. right. So that's why they do this exercise. It's to try to force people to think about different things. Because you can leverage that if that makes sense. It's just one tactic that a company uses. There's lots of different tactics like that. They're all trying to do this, right? They're trying to get people to get out of their normal patterns of thinking. If you're aware of it, right, that's half the battle. Doing it, to your point, is totally hard. Totally agree. And I'm not particularly good at it now because I've been doing this professor thing for 20 years and I'm supposed to write new crazy new papers, but I can't help myself. I keep going back to the old papers <laughs> and just like kind of doing the same thing, right? Because it becomes the path of least resistance. And there's lots of cool historical studies of scientists, right? And you have only so many good years and then meh, right? <laughs> the best stuff is in this first big window. What's interesting they find is, is as a scientist, if you move to a new area, actually it's like almost a rebirth. That's what some of the historical studies show, which is interesting. Um, not all cases are like that, but you know I find that quite interesting. So that's the second one. Think different, association being one of the key things there. And there's lots of other things we could talk about, but I'll hold it at that. The third one, experiment fail. So this one, uh, to me, is pretty cool. Right, and this also, I've pulled three out of the five from the innovator's DNA for you. This one I'll give you with an example. Another fun activity shows up on a TED Talk, right? Maybe some of you have done it. It's called the Marshmallow Challenge. Have any of you done this? So one, two. Two have done the Marshmallow Challenge. Did you watch the video after? Oh, with other kids. This may be a different challenge. Did you just eat them? Okay, so what you do in this one, and it's tell me if it's the same, right? But the marshmallow challenge gives you a bunch of materials, right? And so what it gives you is 20 pieces of spaghetti, 20 pieces of spaghetti, a y one yard of tape, one yard of string, right? And a marshmallow. Marshmallow, right? And so that's what you get as materials. So there you go, Pfft, student, go. Right? And you work in a team of four, and you have 18 minutes. And so what you have to do is you have to build a tower. And you can't tie it to anything. It says it has to be self-supporting. And at the top of the tower has to be a marshmallow. And the winner of the marshmallow challenge builds the tallest tower. And you measure it according to how high that marshmallow is. Right? And so you can imagine. It's pretty fun, right? What happens is everybody starts getting around the table, and you start planning your tower, and you build the tower. And then you put the marshmallow on top. Right? Yay, we win. Right? And what do you win? New Winnebago in the parking lot? I don't know. You win something. Right? Very exciting. What happens, though, in the marshmallow challenge, typically, right, is the following. You get the business students together. Business students, they plan. They, just like you're taught, right, you develop a plan. We'll execute on the plan, right? And so here we go. Plan. Execute. Right? Build. Ta-da, what the video says. We have a great tower. But what happens, unfortunately, in the Marshmallow Challenge, probably nine times out of ten, why does the business build it? You build a build, you put the marshmallow at the top, time's running out, they put it on the top. But no one accounts, typically, in business school for the weight of the marshmallow. And so what happens, is this what happened to you guys as well? It's a different challenge. All the spaghetti sticks break, and the marshmallow goes, and the tower goes, right? And everyone's like, oh, it's a disaster, right? And so what's interesting in the video is they say, you know, these are business students, and nine times out of ten they kind of screw this up. 
and I've done this many times with students. We didn't have the time to do it here today, but it typically happens, right? And so they ask, well, who do you think does really well at this task? Well, happily, yes, engineers do well at this, thank God, right? Absolutely. Who outperforms an average adult, and especially business students, is kids. Kids in kindergarten. So kids, five years old. Why do you think kids five years old kick ass on this? I, I, that's probably true at some level. They, they see things differently because they, they haven't... Yeah, they use it differently. And but, but more than that, right, they don't follow what's called this linear process of planning that we teach in a business school. Essentially, we teach you not to be creative. That's what we're very good at in business school. We try to beat, beat the crap out of you on not being creative. We teach you to, to organize, assign duties and functions, right? Okay, you're going to do that part of the report. You're going to do that. Part, and then you go and you execute, right? What the kindergarten kids do, right, is they try a tower, try a tower, try a tower, try a tower, ta-da, right? They don't spend five minutes planning and assigning, okay, you're going to be the CEO, you're in charge of marketing, you're in charge of, can you do Excel spreadsheets? Okay, you're in charge of finance. They don't do that. They keep the marshmallow at the top, and they quickly iterate, experimenting as they go. Some people call this a design thinking type process. You can use different names for it. What it truly is, right, is experimentation and failure. Rotating quickly, pivoting is a big word now in entrepreneurship, same thing, right? By experimenting very quickly and trying things very quickly, you will be more creative. That's another skill that people have to develop. What's interesting is Lego, very famous European company here, has a consulting arm. Does anyone know that? Lego actually has a consulting arm called Lego Serious Play, and they work with Fortune 500 leading companies in Europe. They go into the C-suite, and they make people play with Lego. How is that for an awesome day on the job, right? But what's interesting is when you get business people to play with Lego is, again, they don't play. They're very goal linear oriented. They're like, okay, what do I build? I build a tower. I build a tower now. Okay, I done. Tower done. What do now? Right? I mean, that's it. When you watch kids play, what do they do? They build something, then they break it. Then they start over. Then they add something to it. <coughs> it's completely almost without purpose. And there's been a number of books written on play and why play is important in life. And we could give you a whole separate talk on play. How in the animal kingdom, play is something really interesting, evolutionary-wise, right? Animals play, but why? If you think about evolution, people that play should die, right? Because play doesn't have any objective. But play is one of the greatest learning tools that we have. In fact, it's very clear, if you look at developmental psychology, that allowing kids to play is a key to their intelligence as they move forward. As an academic, I think this is interesting. I'll lose most of you on this. But play, fundamental. There's some people that argue that play is like one of the basic drives of mankind. Eating, shelter, sex, think of Maslow's hierarchy. Play actually is one of them as well. Is that if you don't play as a person, you actually um, cognitively stagnate. In fact, there's studies that show that people that play don't get dementia, don't suffer cognitive well, I'm making a strong argument for you to all go play. <laughs> but it's really fascinating, all this stuff on, on play. You know, I encourage it. I think people that just mindlessly drill, that's not productive. Play is definitely linked to your health, your happiness. Think about it, right? If you actually spend some time and go out and play, you feel rejuvenated. You're like, yeah, and you're ready to go. Whereas if you don't play for a long time, you're kind of like, I hate you. I hate life. I hate everything. You just become a very grumpy person. And there's lots of ways to play. I'm not saying Lego play. I'm, you can play in sports. You can play in lots of video games. You can play lots of different things. But play is a big part of this third one, experimentation and failure, right? <coughs> so what have I talked about so far? One, two, three things, right? Observation, thinking different, experimentation and fail. If you add some of this to your toolbox, 
And all these aren't new, right? But if you get better at it, you will be more creative. That's the argument. Now, you can definitely debate it, but this is a push specifically from that one article, but also with a fair amount of research backing it up. If we push this, right, because I'm going to hold you for another 15 or 20, to an organizational context, right? And what I mean by that is we can look at companies, case studies of companies that a lot of people would say are very innovative or creative. Does anything match with those companies, right? Well, that's a great question. And I could throw different companies up here on the board and actually talk about it for a long time, but we'll just hold you for 15, right? If we talked about Apple, which is such a stereotype, and I apologize, I'm going to probably use ones that I'm familiar with, but I think most of you know these. And you use 3M as another, and you use Google as another case study. And uh, uh, what other ones should we use? Uh, maybe we just stick with those three. How about Lockheed Martin? Does anyone know this company? What do they make? Airplanes, yeah. Airplanes. Airplanes, airplanes. And why Lockheed Martin's really interesting is they, they became known for something called Skunk Works. It was like, <laughs> is that true? Which fighter? I didn't know this. This is very cool. Long time ago, World War or something. No, not that long ago. <laughs> that's that's cool. So at least there's some awareness of what this brand is. Why I put them on the board for innovation is they developed this notion of Skunk Works. Have any of you heard of what Skunk Works is? So my innovation people better know this. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we don't know this. <laughs> so Skunk Works historically is very interesting. Why is it interesting? Because it is back to World War II fighting in Europe. Because this company built a fighter plane called, and some of you may like planes and stuff. They, they built a, a, a fighter called the P-38 Lightning. Does anyone know this? <laughs> we don't like history. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so the P-38 Lightning is a very famous plane in World War II. Why? Because it had a unique design, right? Its tail was, was linked at the back, so it was kind of like, you guys all think I'm crazy. That's all right. So here's the plane. Excuse the drawing. Right? But it, the back was linked back here. Right? And so kind of like, boy, that's a bad drawing. But you get what I mean. And why it was a cool plane was it was really could really maneuver. Really good, right? So it was a very successful fighter in the war. Yay! Right? So the government came to Lockheed Martin and they said, look, we're fighting the war. The opposition is building this plane that has a jet. Right? And if we don't build a, a fighter that has a jet, we're, we could lose the war. And, and Lockheed Martin said, crap, that would be bad. And they're like, the government's like, you better build one fast. And they're like, well, how fast? And they're like, basically, you got 90 days. <laughs> like, yeah, we can't do that. And they're like, no, no, you really need to do that because the war's going and we need to, we need to build a plane that has a jet engine. And so what they did, what the company did, is they took their best engineer, the one that had designed this P-38, and they said, look, time pressure. What do you need? And he says, I want... 29, 30 of the best engineers in the company. I want us to be isolated. We're going to go to California. We want a, a, an old airplane hangar, which was actually called, that's where the name Skunk Works came from, actually. That's what it was called in the little town. And we want to be isolated, and we want all the resources, and we just want to do our thing by ourselves with no one there. And they had all these different rules, right? But what it became known for was taking high-skilled individuals, taking them away from the company, right, and putting them in a place where they would be under intense pressure to perform. Now, is that the best way to do creative? I, I don't know. But it became known as a Skunk Works project. And since that point in time, a lot of organizations use this. And you can see examples throughout Europe, throughout Asia, throughout America, of isolating a special team and empowering them to produce something very quickly and fast. To me, that's fascinating, right? That's where that idea started. And if you go to... Lockheed Martin's website, you can see the original rules, I think there's like 19 or 20 of them, of building a Skunk Works project, of what, what, what that engineer demanded to do it. Now, did they succeed? They did succeed. The plane actually wasn't needed with respect to the war, 
but they succeeded in doing that. And that has been part of the creativity strategy of that company ever since. Now, why that's interesting, right, is it involves experimentation and failure, putting them away, trying something different, letting them go. It doesn't really involve observation, but it certainly put the engineers in a situation where they had to go off the path of least resistance. Interestingly, Apple does something very simple, similar. They put their designers and innovators in separate areas in the organization, and they let them work. They follow somewhat of a skunk works model. Does Apple talk to consumers for their creativity? No, they don't. And what's interesting when you compare Apple innovation to Google innovation is they're actually almost the opposite in terms of innovation strategy. Apple doesn't talk to consumers. That's all Google does, right? Apple releases only a set number of products. All of them succeed. They don't do experimentation and failure. Google, if you read about Google anywhere, it's all about failure and experimentation. Apple is all about observation. That's how they do their market research. They don't want to talk to consumers, but they want to watch you. <coughs> their creativity model is built on observation and using the skills of their individuals to leverage that observation into building something creative. Pretty cool. Very different. Google empowers the organizations it works with to work on its platform. It doesn't keep people separate, right? The very famous but not quite true anymore. Google time, right? Which gives all employees, which isn't really true by the way, but gives employees time and space to be creative, to add to the collective in terms of creativity. Apple does not do that. 3M. What does 3M do? What does this company do? Any guesses? In creativity, strategy. Is it more like Apple or more like Google? They do observe a lot. That's true. Mm -hmm. They do that. They're actually a mixture. Why I put them in the middle? They're a mixture of the two. Right? They also have time that they give their designers, their employees, to work on projects. They don't let all employees do that, but certainly people that work in innovation have time to work on projects that are of interest to them. They did this far before Google did. Google just was famous for it. But 3M has been very famous for many years. What's interesting about 3M and how they're different than Apple, Google, and Lockheed Martin is they tie their whole business strategy to new products. And they measure, in a KPI sense, they measure success on the number of innovations that come to market. What do I mean by that? In a five-year cycle, right, they expect 25 to 30% of the product revenues coming in to be from products that were launched in the last five years. And they hold that as a metric to success. So in other words, if they're not continually innovating, they will die. That's their belief. Arguably, they're far more innovative than Apple, Google, or Lockheed Martin because their whole system and reward structure is built on what percentage are we at. And what's interesting, if you look at the history of 3M, they brought in from General Electric, actually, a new CEO in 2001, 2002, I don't know, right around then. And they brought him in because this individual from, from General Electric was an expert in what's called Six Sigma. Do they teach you Six Sigma? Do you know what this is? It was like kind of, maybe, sort of. What's Six Sigma? Anyone want to take that? Absolutely, right? Perfect. Right? It's quality function deployment. It's all about quality and improvement in process engineering. Right? And it's so those of you that don't know Six Sigma, it's a very effective tool, right? Six Sigma for building efficiencies and building product quality. And if you follow Six Sigma or your Six Sigma acolyte developed and uh, used extensively at General Electric, right? You know, you can get a black belt in Six Sigma and you can be like, ah, I'm an expert in Six Sigma. So they brought this into 3M. Very effective for 3M in many ways, but what do you think it did to creativity and innovation? Good or bad? Or me? Yeah, it was bad. Trying to create efficiencies, right? If you go back to some of this stuff, 
this isn't about efficiency, right? And so what happened, if they were floating, I think, at about a 30%, 29%, of new products at that time, it fell over eight years to something like 22. I don't know the exact numbers, but it fell about 10%, right? And you saw this drop in terms of the innovation. So that CEO moved on because of that issue. They were losing what you know was their core DNA. And the new CEO came back in and removed this from the organization with respect to innovation. Kept it with respect to production, but removed it from the innovation and creativity labs. And what that did was it moved the creativity back up to a 30%. Now, why is that interesting? Why is that important? For a couple of reasons, right? It speaks to this notion of experimentation and failure. It speaks to this notion of setting firm goals for your organization with respect to creativity. Going to the hard places, if you will, what we talked about before. The one that I didn't put up here, and I have time, so I'll put it up for fun, is a company called Gore. Does anyone know this company? What this company makes? Yeah, they make Gore-Tex, right? And so some of you wear Gore-Tex, or you've heard of Gore-Tex, I hope, right? What's interesting about this company is it makes a ton of other stuff. And when I mean a ton of other stuff, it's completely random. So they make everything from artificial hearts to dental floss to coats, Gore-Tex that you wear, and you say, well, what? Right? Well, this was a company started in the 60s by a, an ex-DuPont worker, engineer, and he said, you know what? I just like innovation. And so just like 3M, which is based on innovation, Gore is an innovative company that's very different than a lot of organizations, though it's, just, it's started to change in the last few years. And why it's different is it's completely flat. And by flat, I mean when you join the company, you don't take a position as VP or senior manager or this or that. Traditionally at Gore, though again it has changed because it's gotten bigger, you would come in and you would join the, a team. And the teams were working on whatever the teams wanted to work on. And there was no real structure in terms of you're in this unit, you're in this, this division, et cetera, et cetera. It was like, hey, I know so-and-so in, uh, in the Arizona office, and they're really good at this. We should call him up and get him over here because he can work on our team. And that's the way the company ran, which is really weird. Most of us would go crazy because you wouldn't know who you're reporting to or what it was about. It was about, I'm on a team that's doing cool stuff, and that person over there can help me, so they're going to be on my team, and we're going to work on a project for three or four years. Oh, it didn't work. That's cool. Let's go find another team. And that's the way you would go to work. And so one of the famous stories they wrote about in Fast Company, which is a magazine about innovation, was about uh, a guy that played in a band, and his guitar strings kept breaking. He's like, go back to my Dyson example. It's like, why can't they make a decent guitar? Hey, we should build guitar strings. So he's like, calls up a few people he knows in the company. He's like, yeah, I think this person would be good because they worked on bicycle cables one year. And this person over here would be good. And boom, builds a team, starts working on it, gets approval from the rest of the organization. They make a guitar string. And now Gore owns like 30% of the guitar string market. Right? Very random in a very weird way to run a company. But if you're talking about innovation, right? This is an organization, Gore, very flat, very egalitarian in terms of it just lets people do what they want to do, but it really facilitates some of the things that we talked about here. What's the moral of the story for the five case studies of companies? Right? Well, they all do it a bit different. And so I think a takeaway to me, you know, as I've studied different companies that are innovative or have creativity in their companies, is there's no secret sauce. Sometimes when you know, I get asked to go do some consulting work or do a project, I say, what's the magic bullet? Tell me exactly what to do. And I say, <laughs> there's no clear answer that says, oh, you have to do it exactly like Apple. Or, oh, 3M. You have to do it like 3M. Or, oh, you have to do it like this. In innovation and creativity, there's lots of different ways to win the game. Almost like strategy. There's a very nice, not very nice, but I say a pretty good book out right now on strategy by Lathley and Martin. And Lathley's the CEO of Procter & Gamble. He was for 10 years 
um, moved moved uh, P and G forward. They they were a nine. So they measure the number of brands they have that do a billion dollars a year in sales. So when he started in 2001, 2002, they were nine products, brands that they had that were billion dollar brands. He moved them to about 22. So he moved the company huge. He did it through innovation and he did it through customer, customer focus, those two things. So he's a pretty cool guy to read about. He worked at P&G for 10 years and he retired, but he just came back last year. And Martin, he's a former dean of the University of Toronto. So they wrote a book on strategy and talks a bit about, uh, this was two years ago they wrote this book, but it, why it's interesting is it, it says as well that there's lots of different ways to win the game strategically and with respect to innovation and creativity. What's important to me, right, is yes, you can think about all these different companies and the different things they did, and all of them worked in different ways, but all of them are made up of the building blocks. And some of them may use observation more than others. Some of them may use experimentation more than others. One of the other elements of DNA is, is called networking. And this goes back to one of the earlier comments on building an environment. Right? Some of them build environments that enable their people to mash up. If you're going to build an organization, you have to think about the environment that people work in. And if you build an environment that enables people to interact, they will be more creative. Environment matters. Some of these organizations do that well. Lots of different ways to win the game, but I'd leave you, right, as we end the lecture, by thinking about yourself. And how are you going to be creative? Because I, I do believe, as we started, if you're going to be a successful leader in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you have to have that in your toolbox. You have to be good at it. Because that's what's going to separate you. And someone said earlier, you know, I have to separate myself. I have to be different than everybody else. Because make no mistake, it's a freaking competitive world. And you guys look solid. But I'll tell you, I see my kids in North America, they look solid too. And so if you want to be a leader and you want to succeed, this is something that I hope today, right, you've got a message on that you can add this to your toolbox and you can get a little bit better at it as you move through life. So we'll leave it at that. Thanks for coming out. And we'll set you free here with five or so minutes to spare. Thanks, guys.